So here we go. Um, this PowerPoint uh, title is Race and Contemplation because um, last week, Richard Rohr named all of his meditations uh, Race and Contemplation. And uh, what I've chosen are two weeks of meditations to try to unpack. And even there, I'm not going to be able to unpack them all. But let's go to the next slide. Um, before we get into the actual meditations, I am can't help myself beginning to list the themes that are coming to us from more than one voice. And here are some of the people that we've been studying. Richard Rohr, Catherine Meeks, Otis Moss III, Brian Stevenson, and Elia Delio. And now I would add um, um, Beverly Daniel Tatum. And here are some themes. How important it is to get the story right. And we'll unpack that later, but I want to give you a heads up. And I refer to this sometimes as narrating and sometimes re-narrating, sometimes getting the narrative right. Another theme is that slavery has been in the human shadow side of our history forever. And American slavery had this new form of racial caste hierarchy introduced that claimed, the white supremacy claimed, that black people are not as good as white people. Now, unfortunately, that got uh, expanded upon in a horrible distortion of Christianity that Elia Delio talked about last time about the Adamic um, paradigm that the most like God were white straight men and everybody else was inferior in the hierarchy. The third thing, uh, racism is fueled by that distorted religion and uh, we'll call, talk about slaveholder religion tonight. Racism is in the cultural water we swim and requiring a cultural transformation. Um, and then uh, this whole notion of worship, meditation, reflection, being a call to change your consciousness because Einstein said you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that caused it. There has to be a new level of consciousness or transformed or healed mentality to bring a solution. So a Confederate consciousness can't solve the problem of Confederate consciousness. The next thing, um, and this, we heard this, we've heard this from everybody, but Brian Stevenson last week particularly said, it's going to take a lot more in addition to protests and some violence uh, to affect, thanks Chris Kinney, he loves this slide, he says, um, to affect real change, hard work deeper than protests. And Beverly Daniel Tatum and I really got into that today. What is, a sign, what is the sign that we've gone deeper than the very important thing of protests. Then finally, so far, um, this is something that Oprah really gave us in the graduation speech. What is your work to do today to use the language of Dr. King to bend the universe a little more towards justice? Okay, next slide. So tonight is all uh, Richard Rohr. Um, this is my favorite slide that I like up upon making with my um, software, my PowerPoint software. And just in case people don't know who Richard Rohr is, um, that is cool, that's fine. And um, he's really about understanding religion from a scientific perspective and from a Jesus and Francis of Assisi perspective. Uh, I love the quote, he, we used to believe that reality was comprised of little separate elemental building blocks, but now we realize that nothing exists in isolation. Rather, as scientists like Franciscan sister Elia Delio put out, everything exists as one interconnected whole. 
And then the next paragraph is just from his website about how he founded the Center for Action and Contemplation in 1987. And yes, Mary Kyle is reminding us that he has a daily email you can subscribe to, absolutely important. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that because all of these slides are from these daily meditations that uh, have come to our inboxes who subscribe to it. You can subscribe to it for free. Just go to the Center for Action and Contemplation that's in this second paragraph because um, he saw a deep need for the integration of both action and contemplation because if we pray but don't act justly, our faith won't bear any fruit. And without contemplation, activists burn out and even well-intended actions can cause more harm. Um, yeah, Carrie Trobert is saying that it's a wonderful act of synchronicity uh, to talk about, uh, of the spirit, to talk about Roar today, given the violence against American Indians in Albuquerque yesterday by white militia. Oh my Lord, I didn't hear about that, oh, Jesus. We're going to talk about anger tonight, too. Um, anyway, um, so he has always thought that it was very important to have them both. And uh, I commend to you the Center for Action and Contemplation website. Tons of things to get there and to learn, including signing up for a daily meditation that's free. Next slide, please. So I have just plucked from this very rich material, two series, two weeks of the daily meditation series. And I chose them because they coincided with George Floyd's murder and the ensuing protests. And now Richard Brooks's murder. And that was, of course, on top of Breonna Taylor earlier and also even earlier in February, uh, the murder of um, Ahmad Arbery in Brunswick. And the name of these two weeks of meditations, one is called the Imitation of Solidarity and the other is Contemplation and Racism. So the foot washing at the top, a symbol of, of solidarity and the different colored circles of contemplation a symbol of multicultural contemplation. Next slide. So um, I'm not gonna read all of these slides to you. Um, I hope that you would take them and contemplate them. Um, but he is so very clear, Richard Rohr, that you don't understand the Bible if you read it from an imperialism or basilica perspective. The Bible is obviously not a Western document, so you can't use a Western logic to understand it either. It also is uh, written from the perspective of those who are oppressed, those who are poor. I always love to tell this, remind everybody that the reason the angels announced Jesus's birth to the shepherds is because they were considered to be the lowest of the low. They were considered sinners, not because they played bridge and had sex and danced and smoked, but because they could not pay the temple tax and they couldn't get in to offer a sacrifice. And that made you a sinner. So the Bible was always about getting the word to the excluded and the oppressed. And if we can't read it from that lens, Roar claims, we can't understand what it's about. So I love this quotation from Isaiah 1. Righteousness and justice are the agenda items for biblical people. Encouraging being aligned with the oppressed those of who are oppressed, and, and, and. So, just want to, we get a lot of slides, pardon me for being a bit breathless, but the hidden nature of systemic oppression makes it all the more remarkable that the revelation of God 
in the Bible is written from the perspective of the oppressed. It's about humility, compassion, nonviolence in the face of oppression. And Jesus, the reason I want to have that table in my imagination, that Eucharistic table, is because it reminds me of how radical Jesus was in having an open table fellowship where everybody was welcome and it totally messed up his reputation. He had a reputation amongst the religious, religious, religious that he hung out with wine bibbers, prostitutes and tax collectors. And they could have added shepherds there too. So next uh, slide. So Rohr says, what it means to be a Christian is to be in solidarity with the pain of the world. I mean, that's my sermon this past Sunday, my Black Lives Matter sermon. Um, it is so, uh, Lafon is asking, is anybody else having trouble hearing me? Okay, nobody else is, Lafon. So Lafon, I wanna send a ten teenager over to your house to uh, fix all your problems. Anyway, this whole thing, oh, thanks, Lala. Thank you for loving my sermon Sunday. Um, in, anyway, it's just really important to reflect on the fact that Christians for the first 300 up to year 400 had to be, had to hide out in the catacombs. And there's a picture of a, the cat, a, one of the most famous catacombs in Rome. Most of them weren't that fine. And then after 400, when Constantine said, you all have to be Christians if you're going to be a part of the empire, then we went from catacombs to basilicas, like St. Peter's there in Rome. So it's really important. And the last emboldened sentences really struck me. Scripture cannot be used by those with power to oppress or impress. The question is no longer how can I maintain my special and secure status? The question is how can we all grow and change together? Now here, Ilya Delio talking about wholeness there. Uh, Martha, C.S. Lewis, pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. That's powerful. I've never heard that quote before. Thank you. <clears throat> so, the whole business of accepting the invitation. Um, oh, the conversation for Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it is our, it is our job to bear witness. Yes, indeed. Um, these are rich chat comments, so we'll send them to everybody. Anyway, the bottom line here is the invitation to solidarity with the larger pain of the world is what it means to be a Christian. And that's what I think Matthew 25 is all about. And Luke 15, Matthew 25, is that I am in those people who are hungry, in prison, naked, on an, immigrants, on and on and on. And that Jesus leaves the 99 and goes out to search for the one unguarded one. Next slide, please, Zach. So um, this is something worth uh, meditating on is Paulo Freire, uh, who wrote, um, yes, Mary Kyle, love God with all your, your whole heart. Absolutely. So Freire is the very famous Brazilian pedagog pedagogical writer, uh, writing the pedagogy of the oppressed. And he's one of Richard Rohr's favorite persons. And it is all about um, solidarity. And um, so Freire leads Rohr to say that there has been too much understanding of Christianity as charity, quote unquote, instead of being in solidarity with those on the margins. Uh, unfortunately, we have to keep going. And uh, next slide, um, Zach. So, for the rest of the week, that week, 
And it was the week of the George Floyd asphyxiation, murder, lynching, crucifixion, horror, 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 is to talk about the five conversions to solidarity. And he leads us through all five and he says, it is so important. Now this is Brian Stevenson's proximity argument. The first conversion is to have basic compassion for the poor in general, or one poor person in particular. To have a real connection. Remember Catherine Meeks on that Monday night lament time? She said, it's not about being a voyeur either. It's about being connected to someone. So the first conversion to solidarity is to have basic compassion. And then throughout this discussion, he said, I will be using the word poor in a very specific way. Those who are powerless, dismissed, or considered less in society. Okay, it's much more than economic poverty, but it certainly includes it. Next slide. The second conversion to solidarity, Rohr claims, is anger at any unjust situation. I just felt that flood of anger come through me when somebody talked about what had happened in Albuquerque to indigenous Native people um, today or yesterday. And oftentimes, when we have a genuine friendship with someone of a different background and life experience, we will witness mistreatment and marginalization. And it is so very important to let us have righteous indignation. Now, we're going to get into slaveholder religion in a few minutes. And part and parcel of slaveholder religion is not being angry. And Paul said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But nowhere is there this business that you never, ever, ever get angry. And so many people suppress that. So let's go to the next slide. I keep this illustration as the next one as well. So Roar, uh, and I'm, a, I'm sorry that this is not as pretty as I like for my slides to be. Anger is a necessary, appropriate, and useful response to this kind of injustice. Okay, because we've got three more conversions. Let's go next slide. So the first one is proximity. The second is anger. And then the third is to make sure that we never dehumanize others or superhumanize others. And again, apologies for uh, this not being as pretty as I like for them. But that's, this is a slide worth reading and how frequently people who walk around in white skin want to superhumanize, yeah, particularly liberals, want to superhumanize people who are of color and then people who haven't recognized their own structural racism in their thinking dehumanize people of color. Okay, next paragraph, I mean, next slide. And then the fourth conversion is deepening recognition of the impact of systemic oppression. Um, and he talks about his own understanding and unpacking his understanding of the impact of systemic oppression. Next slide. And then the fifth conversion to solidarity is a choice to walk with people who are poor and oppressed and to be taught by them and to love them as equals, each of us bearing the divine indwelling spirit within. The whole notion of having a real human relationship with someone who is different is absolutely a responsibility. Not all are guilty, but all of us are responsible, said Rabbi Heschel. Okay, moving along. So, this whole business of thinking of Christianity as a giant act of solidarity with those who are marginalized and all of creation. And he quotes Freire in leading us to have 
what he calls a dialogue and making sure that the dialogues that we are having are with others as who we are. We are others. You remember one of my slides maybe months ago, uh, this Hindu sage was asked, what do we do about others? And his response was, there are no others, which is a proper understanding of loving your neighbor as yourself, because the idea is to love everybody else, as understanding that they are you, which is a Ram Das, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, interbeing, um, Jesus. It is one of the golden threads that runs through absolutely every one of the planetary religions. And I love this quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, we are here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. Remember Charles Einstein talking about the myth of the separate self. And this is a real picture of, I think they're starlings, is that right? Uh, somebody put a note in the chat room, but it's called murmuring when they will dance in the sky together. And this photographer caught them in the shape of a bird. It's just stunning. So it's in nature as well. Next slide, Zach. So this week um, wrapped up by his featuring uh, the colleague of Dr. and Bishop William Barber, whose name is Liz Theo Harris, who really unpacks the fact that this movement for elimination of poverty, which is Bishop Barber's picking up on Martin Luther King's march on, on Washington, the, the Poor People's March, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, is really taking a look at poverty. And it is a movement of the rejected, which is a resonance with the book that we were studying during Lent before COVID closed us down, named Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. Now, oh, I forgot the point I was going to make. Um, it'll come back to me. So, Zach, let's keep going. So, here's her uh, theological reflection on the the word Basileia, which uh, is translated, I think, unfortunately, as the kingdom of God. Um, empire of God is okay. I think civilization of God is a, a very good way to uh, translate Basileia. Um, our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, says that he likes to translate that as the way life would be if love had its way. Ah, now I've just remembered. So a little appetizer about this coming Sunday. So after Dr. Tatum and I uh, got through some earlier comments, I said, okay, let's talk about what is the hard work. And the place she started was economics. And I can't wait for you to hear her just lay that out. And she says, we have to start with a living wage. Oh God, Abadi, I just got so excited about the fact that if we're serious about the hard work of anti-racism, we have to talk about the living wage. Okay, next slide. So a series of slides that I didn't dress up, but these are really important Reflections by Liz Theo Harris on the Kingdom of God. Next slide. And now, and uh, yay, Adelaide Steedley says, amen, income in, I mean, it was stunning what Dr. Tatum, just, she just laid out the story of why <clears throat> people of color are always poor and how in Atlanta and Adelaide and some others of us have talked about this with um, Raphael um, Bostic 
the head of the Fed, is that of 50 large cities, Atlanta is 50th in 50th place about income mobility. So the way Dr. Tatum put it this morning, if you are born poor in Atlanta, you're likely to die poor because there's no economic mobility or not sufficient. So this is a series of slides now. <clears throat> um, uh, Judy Andrews is saying support the poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival and their mass poor people. And um, there was something on that. Well, give us a link on that, uh, Judy, and we'll send that out also. And that's another, by the way, that is another uh, website that Kim Jackson and I, Reverend Kim Jackson and I talked about. The uh, link is right above it, Ed. I'm sorry? The link is right above it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Judy. Um, anyway, so now we're shifting. I skipped a week of meditations, and all of them are great because it's about the alternative society. Um, but now I thought it was important to unpack these slides about racism, where Richard talks about his own white privilege and how he was asleep, thinking that racism was a thing of the past. And now we're being shown how limited our vision is. Next slide. <clears throat> so it is very important for un to understand that we all belong and it is very important that black lives matter. And that he says, I would never have seen my own white privilege if I'd not been forced outside of my dominant white culture by travel, by working in the jail, by hearing stories from counselees, and frankly, by making a complete fool of myself in so many social settings, most of which I had the freedom to avoid. And that is the unfortunate horror of white privilege is that we can be naive and about the impact of our lives. And Dr. Tatum today says, Ed, this is about running a marathon. And we need to invite everybody to get in training. And you will go slow like you always do. And it's very important to get people to run with you, to train with you. And Sometimes you need to train with people who are training at the same rate and running at the same rate, and then just keep on, keep on, keep on. I, I can't wait for you to hear her analogy about training for the marathon uh, today. Okay, Judy is sending us a better link. Thank you, Judy. Next slide, Zach. Okay, um, so I love this first sentence. Power and privilege never surrender without a fight. If your entire life has been to live unquestioned in your position of power, a power that was culturally given to you, but you think you earned, there's almost no way you will give it up without a major failure, suffering, humiliation, or defeat. It's that whole notion, and Judith is saying black people being poor is not an accident, the clan, and yeah, and she traces all of that, including when Social Security and a lot of other social safety net legislation was passed, the Southerners said, but you have to exempt black people, which was a total setup for multi-generational systemic poverty. So back to this slide where Richard Rohr, I mean, he, he talks about how so frequently white folks feel like they um, had a home run when actually they were born on third base. Yeah, the GI Bill is a very good example, Shane McCarthy calls it. Anyway, if God operates as me, God operates as thee too, and the playing field is utterly leveled forever. So that's a powerful slide too. 
I mean, Richard Rohr is just tearing it up, excuse me. It's just wonderful in his meditations. Next, next slide. So here he returns to anger two weeks later. Then he has invited Barbara Holmes, who is a new one of his central faculty members at the Living School at the Center for Contemplation and Action. And he really unpacks and uses her again to make sure that we all need a way to channel and reconcile our anger with our faith. A theology of anger for communities under siege assumes that anger as a response to injustice is spiritually healthy. My intent is to highlight three ways that anger can contribute to spiritual restoration. Next slide. So here he unpacks that. And I think it's really important for those of you who can print out your slides to print this out and use this as a meditation. We're not gonna go into it, unfortunately, because of our time. Next slide. I just bit off a lot for tonight. Now, on Wednesday of that week, he talks about Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. And Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove has written a book called Slaveholder Religion. And this relates to the religious theological underpinning um, and so let me just read what people are saying. Mary Lynn Owen is saying, I'm so needing this theology of anger. I had no idea there was a welcome place in my church for your anger. Yes, this church is safe for you to be seen. Oh my God, so important. And you can't, and Martha Eskew says, you can go to the uh, Center for Action, Contemplation and Action and see and print whatever the entire body of these daily meditations, exactly. So I want to go back to share her slaveholder religion, because this is one of the passions I have of getting healed myself from having been assigned this toxic theological religious narrative. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove has written a book about it and how to get healed from it. And he says his whole journey toward freedom from slaveholder religion has been one of unlearning a hyper individualized piety. Richard Rohr says that is what I would call an obsession with our individual salvation projects. Back to Wilson Hartgrove. I've had to learn that this is a spiritual version of the myth of the self-made man or woman that the social systems that privilege whiteness created. Now, there are three things here that I want to emphasize. One is that the slave business industry was supported by Christian theologians. It was so sick that Jesus was the name of one of the slave ships. Captain by St. Sir John Hawkins, by appointment of the Queen of England. Slaveholder religion is a total off the rails interpretation of Christianity. Totally hijacks anything about who Jesus really was. And not only does it do great harm to other people, i.e. a knee on the neck, been doing that for 400 years. It also bruises the soul of people who express slaveholder religion. And one of the diminishments of a life of slaveholder religion is that it makes you think that your salvation is an individual project, which is also a delusion and a distortion of Jesus. Next slide. 
so here's Jonathan at the top and here's Thomas Merton. The alternative to the hyper individualized spirituality that comes along with slaveholder religion is communal spirituality. We are saved together, not alone. Now the reason Thomas Merton's photo shows up here is he said to, in a very important letter to Jim Forrest, when Jim was a teenager living with Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement in New York City, and he was going out and protesting the war in Vietnam, and he wrote Merton, and he was just burned out. And Merton said, you've got to understand this is about relationships. The reality of personal relationships is that which saves everything. Well, we have seen so much Christianity, what Richard Rohr calls churchianity, focusing on that you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which is a quotation from Paul, but is a total misinterpretation of what Paul was talking about. Paul never used the word you, Y-O-U, in the singular form. It was always plural. In fact, if it were rightly translated, it would be y'all. And he's saying, y'all have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling together. Next slide. So, he and Barbara Holmes are calling for what they call crisis contemplation, which in their imagination had to be going on with these blessed siblings in the human family stacked like cordwood on these slave ships doing the passage. And that there had to be a common belief, not hyper-spiritualized piety, um, a common belief in the seen and the unseen. And contemplation is turning to the spirit realm for guidance and relief. And I've switched this thing. We need to be guided by our contemplative life. Next slide. So, contemplation must press beyond the constraints of religious expectations to reach the potential for spiritual centering in the midst of danger. Howard Thurman was all about this. Dr. King was all about this. Dr. King and all of his community would not let people go and do the sit-ins unless they had gone through spiritual boot camp to be spiritually centered and to carry that energy into those sit-ins, those bus trips. It was a contemplative action. Next slide. And I just loved this and just wanted to present it starkly. That the moan in African American spirituality is the birthing sound, the first movement toward a creative response to oppression, the entry into the heart of contemplation through the crucible of crisis. How long, O oh Lord, must our people suffer? We moan. Next slide. So let's go ahead and laugh. This is a picture of me uh, wearing the most stylish trousers that you could wear in the South in May of 1968. I was the president of the student body. Dr. King had just been assassinated. And I asked my friends and my professors to go and march with me 
as, I know it really is groovy, Mary Kyle. Somebody said it's just doggy. Uh, anyway, the Poor People's March came through Macon. And I asked my friends and my professors to please um, march with me. And so we did. And Betty, Betty Jean Walker is holding up a sign with me that says, we shall overcome. Y'all, out of the blue, three weeks ago, her son found me on Twitter and now has reconnected Betty and me. And we had our first conversation in more than 50 years on the phone last week. But this was a prayer meeting at the Vineville Baptist Church before we got onto Vineville Avenue. And we had a prayer meeting. And Dr. Barbara Holmes talks about how when the children were escorted into schools by National Guardsmen, everybody sang, Jesus loves me. And it became the anthem of faith in the face of contradictory evidence. You cannot face German shepherds and fire hoses with your own resources. And the whole thing was that we were praying before we got out there and walked and had protests. It's my first experience of being spit at and being called an N-word lover. Next slide. So the issue is, and this is gonna give us time to talk. This is the Oprah issue that we looked at a month ago. What is your work to do today to bend the universe a little more towards justice. Because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. believed in the universe being a moral universe. Desmond Tutu is really clear. We live in a moral universe and the arc of it is long and it bends toward justice and it will not bend without us working it. 